Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning. <laughs> good morning. Hey, I want to welcome all of those that are joining us here and also online uh, for the Sabbath school. Don's going to be teaching our lesson this morning on the Old Testament hope. But before we get started, there's just a couple things we'd like to uh, make people aware of. And uh, the first thing is our free offer. Our free offer, which is the mystery of death. It was written by John Bradshaw. And since we're covering this Old Testament hope of the resurrection, uh, and as we're getting into this lesson about death, I thought it'd be good that we have this free offer. So we want you to go to uh, whitehousesda.com. You can go to our library, find this book, and just click on the word free. It'll be a little form that you fill out, and we send this to you completely free. It's entitled The Mystery of Death. So we want to encourage you to go to our website. Also, we, uh, we like to take prayer and praise requests. And so while you're at our website, you can just click on the prayer and praise button and uh, fill out a prayer request or just a praise how God is working in your life. Send that to us and uh, we would love to pray for you. We've got a team here that prays weekly uh, for the church and for people that we contact. And so we're excited about that. But uh, anyway, I'm going to turn it over to you, Don. So there's there's power in prayer. Praise yes, God for that. And, and I love that. Absolutely. Before we start our lesson, though, let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Loving Father, we thank you so very much for your presence here with us this morning. We praise you for another Sabbath and for the beautiful weather that we have today. Lord, as we open our Bibles this morning, we need you, Lord. Open our hearts, open our minds, and open our eyes so that we can see you more clearly and become more closely entwined with you and your love and your plan for each of us. So be thy will. Amen. We'll start with our memory text this morning. It's found in Hebrews chapter 11, two verses, verses 17 and 19. By faith, Abraham, when put to the test, offered up Isaac. He who had received the promises was ready to offer up his only son. He considered the fact that God is able even to raise someone from the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Hmm. I don't know that I'm ready for that level of a test. I hope that I would pass, but I don't know. Abraham was a wonderful man and truly, truly knew God to go to this level with him. Before we get started on our lesson, I do have some history I like to talk about. You know, those of you that know me know that I take time and read definitions of words. And the, there are a lot of words that we use over and over again without giving much thought to, but this has a full basis and foundation in what we're actually studying. The difference in the resurrection and what's been said and taught in the world between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I want to get down to the basics on this right here. The difference in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, this is a legal word, testament. Those of you probably have read this word your whole life and never given much thought to the word testament. Well, think about last will and testament that we all make. And for a testament or testate to take place, something or someone has to die. Mm -hmm. You know, the will part of it is we tell why we want all our possessions to go. The testament is the fact that my wishes and my thoughts and what I've set up take place. Old Testament... Salvation by the blood of animals. In faith that we were going to have the true testament coming. The New Testament simply is the fact that we now have the blood of Christ and we also have salvation and resurrection by faith. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of y'all have given any thought to that, but there is no difference in the story going from Old Testament to New Testament. Mm -hmm. Merely the fact that we were with faith by the blood of animals versus now we have faith in the blood of Christ. The basic difference is just view. Right. It's, it's from, where you're, from where you're looking at it from. So, right, you're looking, in the Old Testament, they were looking forward. Right. Right? And in the New Testament, we are looking... We're still looking forward. We're still looking forward, <laughs> but our hope is in what is coming, but it's based on what has happened. Absolutely. And, and what is happening, Absolutely. too. But we look but back same, to the cross. Same theological story throughout. Mm -hmm. There is no change. We continue to have faith in Christ. That's right. All the way through. Anyway, the Old Testament's grounded in hope, 
not on Greek ideas about the natural immorality, which is something that has crept in thanks to Satan, mm -hmm. but on the biblical teaching of the final resurrection of the dead. And there's going to be two resurrections. We're not getting into that, that today, but the one that's most important is the resurrection for those that are saved and have a proper relationship with Jesus Christ. Right. Towards the end, it kind of hints at the two resurrections when you get into Daniel chapter 12, but that's not the focus. That's not our focus today. Yeah, right. Anyway, the big <coughs> thing is there's different crazy people who have written up different theses that everybody wants to think that they can think higher thoughts than what we are. And it's, I always find it entertaining to think that uh, even though I had neurologists as patients at, and friends and stuff, and mm -hmm. I asked him one time, I said, you know, y'all are the top of the food chain as far as science goes and, and being smart and being able to do all things, but yet you guys can't even build a tomato. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me, shook his head, and he said, you're right, I can't make a tomato. I can study it. I can study it. You know, I can take the seed out of a tomato. I can plant it in dirt. I can put water on it, a little fertilizer, get it out to the sunshine and stuff. Mm -hmm. I can nurture it, but it makes itself and then reproduces. Yep. But we, we can't do that. So to think that I'm the top of the food chain in the universe, as vast as the universe is, is rather simplistic in its best. Yeah, and matter of fact, in the lesson, it kind of later in the lesson, it, it really speaks about, you know, um, the power of the grave. And then it kind of gets into later the depths of the earth. It talks about man and how we are just like the you know, the flower that fades and the grass that withers away. And so you get a, you get a real perspective of, of humanity right. in our, our mortal state. Yeah. Um, over it's, and over and over. It's very interesting. God brought life into existence from non-life through the power of his word. I can't even begin to conceive of power of that magnitude. He spoke and it came into being. Yeah. That's right. He spoke, and there it was. He commanded, and it stood fast. Right. Yeah, that, it, it's interesting in this verse. It's interesting how he talks about he spoke the word, and then it said he breathed. Right. So what's interesting is this combination between his word and his breath. Yeah. Right? So when God speaks his word, just like all of us speak, right, there's breath that is used in the process of speaking. Right. And here it's interesting that God's breath carries with it what? Life. Yeah. There's power in his breath, literally life-giving power in his very breath. Now, when we speak, and we breathe all the time too, right, right. now, right? I don't create trees from my breath. No. no Matter of fact, some days you just want to avoid my breath altogether. But no, as a healthcare person, you know how that goes. I've done CPR and all this stuff, and I've helped breathe into people and stuff, but... If there wasn't life in it, it didn't come back. Yeah, that's, a, that, <laughs> that's exactly right. It was and, nothing there. I couldn't, I, we couldn't fix it. And, and that's how you see the, the, the combination of the creation story. Even in the resurrection, even in the hope of the resurrection, we still go back to the creation story. And uh, it's, it's, you know, in, in, in relationship to all of this. Why should we doubt his capacity? To, if he was able to create in the first place, why should we doubt God's capacity to recreate human life and to restore it back to its original identity? It, yeah, and that's the hope that Abraham had here in the memory verse. Yeah. He's like, if you're asking me to sacrifice my son, then I have faith that you can bring him back from the dead. That's beyond my capacity of understanding, but I accept it in faith. Yeah, wait until we get to later in the lesson. <laughs> right. I, I had to get to Ezekiel because that was, that's interesting when dead bones are told to live. I shall see God. Let's, I'm going to read Job chapter 19, 25 to 27. If you'll be looking up the other text that we're going to be reading out sure. of this. And we're going to read this and compare it with, first John, with John 1, 18 and 1 Timothy. When and under what circumstances would God, was Job expecting to see God? So I'm going to read Job 19, 25 through 27. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, it's a very powerful right here, that in my flesh I 
shall see God. Yeah. Now, this is as basic as it can get in here. But, but there's a deep theological significance of the fact that you will be standing in the resurrection in your own flesh. Yeah. Not floating around as some, like, you know, ghost or whatever, where it's just a spirit that's just flying around. But they understood we're standing in our flesh, but it's a different type of flesh. See, so many people want to lean on their own understanding and try to convince others that their own understanding is better than what God has said. But how much better can you get? God, this is just simple. In my own flesh or in your own flesh, you will see God. Right. That's simple, straightforward. Nothing ambiguous about this. No, but the flesh, what's interesting is that the Bible helps us understand, like you're saying, it's very clear and as you keep studying, you realize, oh, there's two different types of flesh. There's a sinful flesh, right, which is given to corruption. Right. And then there's a glorified flesh that is righteous at the second coming of Christ, that is made righteous, right? Or we're, we're going through that process now, but there's clearly a transition right. and the type of flesh we're talking about. But nonetheless, you're still going to be you. I'm going to be me. So I'll recognize you. That's the point. In my flesh, I will see God. In your flesh, you will see God. And hopefully we're all there together. Go ahead and read. Let's compare this with John, 1 John 1, 18 and 1 Timothy 6, 16. It says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. That's uh, 1 John, or John 1, 18. And then I'll just turn really quick. 1 Timothy um, specifically here, 1 Timothy chapter 6, six verse 16. And uh, as I was reading this, I was like, it's, it's really powerful reading the series of verses, but nonetheless, it, um, can I go to verse 15 and then just oh, read sure, 16? Sure, sure, sure. It says, which he will manifest in his own time, talking about Christ, his appearing, he who is blessed and the only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only has immortality, dwelling in unpro unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor, everlasting power. Amen. Potent. <laughs> Powerful. Yeah. No one has seen God, but Jesus explains him to us pretty well. Life is not fair. We especially see this when we see the suffering of good folks that have done nothing really wrong, and yet people that are evil seem to pos prosper. How do you balance that out, and what do you think about that? About evil Yeah, evil and, and how, how the good people are attacked. You know, we see it with Job. Righteous man, <laughs> having a great time with his family, as good families should be able to do, so having a celebration there, and all at once, in a matter of minutes, He's found out he's lost all of his children, he's lost all of his cattle, his, his everything, and only, only I, I alone escaped as these messengers run into the house. Yeah, and it's interesting here in the lesson at the bottom of the page, you know, you think about Job's surround, he was surrounded by, and you think about the time in which we live, right? There's uh -huh. like a connection literally between Job and, and the days in which we live. It says he was surrounded by sickness, pain, economic collapse, social reproach, an emotional breakdown. Now, if you look at the world in which we live, I think to some <laughs> degree, not personally necessarily, but this happened to him personally. All of these different things. Well, I mean, look around us. All of these things are happening, and yet Job stays firm in his hope right. that if I die, I'll live again. I'm going to live again. See, he saw beyond this physical life here and now. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to do is we've, each of us has to see beyond this physical life that we're dealing with now to the perfect utopia that God has planned and has set up for us mm -hmm. called heaven and the recreated earth here. We're going to see God in our flesh again, and there will be no more sin, sickness, or sorrow, and death. That's right. We won't have to worry about economic collapse. No. We won't have to worry about social reproach, right, emotional breakdown. None of that. None of that. It's not going to matter. <coughs> All right? Though he, down further in the Sunday, it says, Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. This is what Job said to his friends and to his wife. 
Even imagining that soon his life would end, he kept his assurance that death would not have the final word. <coughs> Job himself would see God in his own flesh. This is an unmistakable glimpse of the resurrection. Yes. And I like this final paragraph down here at the bottom. All, actually, Job's statement about the resurrection was filled with the same assurance as found centuries later in Martha's Martha utterance to Jesus. I know that he, Lazarus, will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Job, like Martha, had to claim this promise by faith, even though, unlike Job, Martha would soon be given powerful evidence for her belief. Mm -hmm. And, and that's the same for us. We should claim that it's the same thing in the memory verse when Abraham, it says he received the promise. Because he received the promise, he was ready to offer up his son. Right. You know, Martha's the same way. She's like, listen, I've received the promise. I know that at a later time, I'll see my brother. I'm going to see my brother. Why? Because I've received the promise. I think sometimes we don't necessarily, we quote the promise. Or we read, you know, you see promise books, right? And you, you read all of these promises that are in these promise books. But I don't think we ever really, not saying we don't, but, you know, it's one thing to read a promise. It's another thing to receive a promise. So when you receive a promise, it literally changes your mindset. So when, when we understand correctly the promise of the resurrection... Our mindset is changed. It's different. In other words, and that's why Job's like, I can go through this because I'm going to come out the other end even if I die. Right. I'm going to come out the other end because of the promise. And it, and it transforms your, your, your mental state in different situations. That's the power of faith. And then you'll never have it until you exercise it. Yeah, and what's powerful, that's right, and what's powerful about Martha, she received the promise in word from the Old Testament, but guess who was standing in front of her? The promise fulfilled, right? Jesus Christ was standing in front of her, and he says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. So it's like, sure, you've heard about it in the Old Testament, and you're right, but I'm just letting you know, I am. Like here, yeah, in person. It's just powerful. And I have the power to call him out, and he did. That's right. Yeah. Lazarus, come forth. And what's so hard is that the people there that were surrounded the grave, many of them walked away, and they didn't fully believe in Christ even after he resurrected Lazarus from the grave. <sighs> That's a powerful point. So You're right. Psalms 49 on Monday, what led the psalmist to be so sure of his final resurrection in contrast to those who perished without that assurance? I'm going to read here Psalms 49, but I'm going to start in verse 14 because I want to lay the groundwork for it just a little bit better. The whole chapter is a wonderful chapter. If you haven't read it, go home and read the whole chapter. We don't have time to read the whole chapter here. <laughs> like sheep... They are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them. The upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. And their beauty shall be consumed in the grave far from their dwelling. And that's what we do. We bury our dead away from home. Most of us. There's a few family cemeteries out there still where somebody gets buried close to home. But life goes on. These folks are no more with us. And in verse 15, but here's the beauty of it. This is what we're getting to. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. You know, he sets this up. Sorry, I didn't. Go ahead. He, he really sets this up because I just wanna, want you to understand the difference that's going on as Don's alluding to that and, and bringing that out. Back in verse 10, he's talking about the, the difference between the wise, the wise and the foolish, right? It kind of reminds you of a parable in the New Testament, right? In Matthew 25, Jesus talks about the wise and the foolish. And he says, the wise, by the way, had enough oil in their lamps. The foolish didn't have enough oil. And it's interesting, though, but apparently the foolish still have enough wealth, 
if you read this. So it's like, what is it? Is it wealth that you want or is it oil that you want? Because he specifically makes a distinction, right, right. between those that were living for this world. He says, and leave their wealth to others, verse, this last part of verse 10. Their inner thought is that their houses will last forever. Their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. And, and when I read this, I thought to myself, you know, I lived in Montana. Right. You've been to Montana. Yeah. They have these massive ranches, right? And when you drive up to these ranches, what are they named after? Right? They've got these big, they name their ranches. They name their lands. And, and many of them name them after themselves, right? Because that's going to be... My posterity. If that's forever, right? That's, that's what they're thinking when, when they name these things that way. And he's like, listen, but in the end, what really matters is that, hey, God's going to redeem my soul from the power of the grave. And he's separating what happens to the foolish, but then in turn, what happens to the wise. And, uh, and so this is really a, a powerful statement in relationship to the power of as we're talking about, you know, from the power of the grave. You know, I read history a lot, and I can tell you a lot of historical facts and things, but none of the people that I tell you about are still around to correct me or to tell me that I'm right or wrong. Yeah. Their, their, thoughts are, their, their thoughts perished. They're in the ground. They're buried. They've deteriorated. They're in the dust. And if they've had the right relationship with the Lord, they'll hear the voice of the Lord at the when he comes back and they'll come to life That's the whole and they'll be known as they were known then but today they're not here yeah it's like it's like the rich man that built bigger barns yeah. and the lord's like listen you're building bigger barns for yourself but your soul will be required of you so the bottom line is what good did all that do in, yeah. in in the end what good and and yet you look at it and you say but this is the hope god is offering right right avail yourself of this hope yeah you know this resurrection hope but there is definitely a difference between the foolish and wise in relationship to this hope and how they live when they have received those promises yeah all right i'm gonna read a paragraph here out of our lesson it's about two-thirds of the way down on mondays but there is a radical contrast between them on one side are the fools who perish even though trying to find assurance in their own transient possessions and accomplishments, which mm -hmm. is exactly right. what you were just saying. In contrast, the wise behold beyond the human saga in the prison of the grave the glorious reward that God has mm -hmm. reserved for them. With this perception in mind, the psalmist could say with confidence, but God will redeem my soul. Mm -hmm from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. That was Psalms verse 15 again, 49, 15. So here's a question for you. It's mm -hmm. on the bottom of the page down here. And this is our, I like these questions at the bottom because it's where I get to think. <laughs> what are the ways that you've been able to see the folly of those who trust in their own wealth and accomplishments? How can keeping your eyes on the cross protect you from falling into the same error? You know, the cross, I appreciate that question. The cross is ultimately all about what? Jesus. Yeah. And Jesus was making a sacrifice, right? So, so the, the context of it is what? It's sacrifice. It's, it's giving. It's not in receiving. receiving. And so this, this separates the wise and the foolish. The wise are seeking to gain from God, but they're giving in return rather than keeping it all to themselves. But the foolish, hey, they're all about gain, man. I just, I just want to gain as much as I can. I want to keep as much as I can. And I, and I, I just want to keep passing it on. And, but in the end, it's like, but where's the hope of the resurrection and all of that? Where's your future? You know? What is it going to gain you? Yeah. I ride around the countryside and, and I I like to take the back roads, and you drive through the back roads, and you'll see these old homesteads that are grown up, the house falling down, or sometimes you'll see where the house burned or fully rotted out, and you'll see the chimney standing there, and there's nothing there. And you know that that's where a family lived, flourished, had their lives, whatever, but it's all gone now. What's left is 
part of a rotting, rotten, rottening structure. Yeah, and, and that's ultimately what's going to happen. This is why, if you, if you don't mind, if Go we ahead. turn to Matthew 5 really quick, sure. this is what I love how Jesus brings out in the Beatitudes. When he's preaching on the Mount of Olives, he's making this, this hope the center of what he's talking about. Because he says it quite often, right? In verse 3, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven. Okay? Then, then when you go to verse 5, he says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit, inherit the earth. Okay, and then he goes on again in verse eight, and he says, "Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God." So this is all revolving around this very central issue and hope. And then verse ten, he does it again. He says, "Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom, kingdom of, heaven. of heaven." He's already said this. And then when you get to verse twelve, right? Verse twelve says, um, "Rejoice and be exceedingly glad." Now think about this. For great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So he's like, you should be exceedingly glad, even in persecution, because of this hope. There's a saying that I tell. Because of this resurrection. I tell a lot of people, focus on winning the war rather than the battle. The battles are all the tribulations that you and I go through as we live our life. Winning the war is getting to see Jesus and getting to see God in heaven. Mm -hmm. That's like when I'm driving from here to Nashville and people cut me off and stuff. I don't get angry. <laughs> my goal and my, I consider my war, winning the war, is I get to Nashville where I'm going in one piece safe and all, all four corners of my car are still intact. <laughs> the battle was me yielding to the to the people that choose not to drive safely. I had another word that tried to pop out of my mouth and I <laughs> didn't want to use it. But the difference between the battle and the war, and it's with raising our children. The goal is when we raise our children, we want them to be successful at the end when they're, when they're adults rather than winning the battle. I've heard people say, well, my son got smart with me, so I kicked him out of the house. Well, in the end, you lost by doing that because now your son has a couple of kids or whatever, and he's having to come home every time and turn around begging for money from mom and dad. Success is when you work and nurture, lose a lot of battles, and your kids are adults and they're independent, they're on their own, they're, they're functioning as they should. So yeah. win the war, not the battle. And, and the war really is, it, it's, it's this hope. It's, it's ultimately being prepared to, to receive of the promise not just in figure in, in words but actually in reality seeing the like bigger we want, picture yeah we want to be there realistically um and and this is what when it says they received the promise it's like they knew that one day they would be there realistically speaking you know we've been studying daniel uh on wednesday nights and it's interesting that the lesson goes back to daniel even on this page it goes to daniel chapter 7 verse 18 and it's talking about the, the persecution that the saints face from that little horn power. But then it ultimately says, but they are given the kingdom in, in the end. And that's the war that you're talking about. Hey, we can, we can, by the grace of God, win the war. We can have dominion and we can be given the kingdom again um, because Jesus made that all possible. When Jesus died on the cross, the war was won. Mm -hmm. when his sacrifice was accepted. Mm -hmm. I don't have to die the permanent death. No, that's right. Jesus. He, he rose, and that's right. He and rose. So, he rose. Right. So he, over, have he overcame death. See the big picture, folks. Open your eyes. Yeah. He there, overcame death. It's way bigger than this. Psalm 71, what did David imply when he asked God to bring him up again from the depths of the earth. This is found in Psalm 71. And I started reading a little bit before verse 20 that it said here, because it has a lot of good, powerful thoughts here. I'll start with verse 19 in Psalm 71. And also, your righteousness, O God, is very high. You who have done great things, O God, who is like you? You who have shown me great and severe troubles, shall revive me again. 
and bring me up again from the depths of the earth. Mm -hmm. See, that's the promise. We're reading on these promises over and over again how that death as we know it on this earth is not the end. Yeah. It's not the end. And this is why, in, like in verse 14, if you go back to Psalm 71 and you look at verse 14, he says, but I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. So when you, when you look at what you just read, right, that hope of the resurrection and the fact that, listen, listen there is life after death. Death doesn't have to be the last stage in our life no okay at all um and so and so when we understand this truth we can say with the psalmist here i will hope continually right and i will praise yet more and more so this is the life of the christian who has the hope of the resurrection right you think of the sadducees later the lesson kind of alludes to the Sadducees, they didn't have any hope in a resurrection because they didn't even believe in a resurrection. What is life like? Think about it. What would life be like if you didn't have the hope of the resurrection? If you knew that literally all you're going to do is just grow up, grow old, and die. I've had and that's the end of it. I've had the unfortunate privilege of working with a couple of atheists as co-workers mm -hmm. And the mindset is totally different. Everything they do is about what I can get out of it for me. Well, it's now. It's in the here it's and in now. The, it's in the present. Only Just, what I can get here and now matters. I don't really care about you as a person. I will stab you in the back in a heartbeat just so that I can take two steps further forward and achieve and get something a little bit more for me yeah. now. Yeah. You, you know what's even worse than that? What's even worse than just the fact that I'm here and now because I don't acknowledge or believe yet or understand a resurrection. What gets me is the people who know that there is a resurrection and they know that there's life after death and yet they still live for the just here and now. That's to me that it's like the Lord saying, listen, for instance, I wish that you were either hot, hot, or cold, but please don't be lukewarm. Lukewarm is that middle state where it's like, well, yeah, okay, I understand those things, but I'm still building bigger barns for myself. Versus, no, I'm actually hot, and as the Lord is leading me in my life, do you follow what I'm saying? There's a clear difference. I'm, I'm actually living for the resurrection day, I'm living for that life that is beyond the grave. That's what I'm living for. I'm not just living now. Right. Right? Just in the present. A friend of mine gave me a book. It's from a different religious background, and I'm not going to call the name of the religion. And it was, they had decided and figured out somehow from reading the Bible that there is a heaven. And the guy got into questions and answers that people had mailed him. He was his, the theologian of this particular religion. And the people were asking him about the things that they could take with them from earth to heaven. And as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, y'all haven't figured anything out about heaven yet. If you think the stuff on this earth matters. Yeah. I have not seen nor ear yeah. heard the things that my God has laid aside for those that love him and believe in him. And he's going to take with him to heaven. Yeah. There's nothing on this earth, if I need it, that won't be there. You know, even, even when we talk, like, you're right, even when you talk about, like, gold, I mean, if, if somebody had a, you know, a, a closet full of gold, and they're like, I'd like to take this closet full of gold with me, but then when you read in Revelation, the gold that's in heaven is transparent, and you can actually, it's so pure that you can see through it. And they paved the streets with it, by the way, so your stuff yeah. that you've kept in your closet <laughs> is basically their asphalt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's exactly right. So it's, it, it, we have this view of our things as being superior versus what God really has planned for us is so much more superior. And who gave us the than, gold here on the earth could, anyway? Than what we could ever imagine. Who gave us the gold that's here on the earth anyway? Where did it come from? From God. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it all did. And, you know, so, and so all this stuff of putting stuff aside, thinking you're doing something special. Yeah, and you know, I think, I really believe that God is so longing for that day 
when he can open up the, the, the kingdom of heaven. And, and we're told in Revelation, one door, one gate is one pearl. Okay, so, so one pearl, you know, we think of pearls in terms of like this size, and you, you get a whole, ladies get a whole string of pearls, right? And you're like, I got a whole, you, you can't even imagine. I mean, Revelation tells us one gate of the city is one pearl. So you can imagine those pearly, that's why they call them the pearly gates, okay? Because when those gates open, that's one pearl. I, I can just imagine the Lord's just waiting. I have so much, right? I have so much I want to show you. We're clueless. And yet we live for just today. And it's like, why just today when there's so much more that's available? I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs here and we'll it. flip over to Wednesday's lesson because we're going to run out of time and not finish hardly any of this. That's a good thing to think about, though. It right? is, though. Heaven? Absolutely. Right. I love the idea. Of, <laughs> of, I can't imagine seeing one pearl being right. that big because I know yeah. the gates of heaven are bigger than I can imagine. Because yeah. if, if, the, if the new earth is, is in, the new Jerusalem is as big as it's told to me, I, you know, I can't conceive of it. It's beyond my comprehension. It, it, it is. And sorry, it was in verse seven, or chapter 71, verse 18, you're going to read a few paragraphs. And he just says, oh God, do not forsake me right. until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to come. I mean, it's like, Lord, I want to share this good news with everybody I come in contact with, that there is life beyond the grave. I appreciate you adding to it. It's, Sorry. It, it, it doesn't bother me if we don't get through the lesson. It's so odd. <laughs> we're having a great time, and we're learning about yeah. God and, and expanding and thinking more realistically yeah. about what it is we're going for. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about. Amid his trials, David finds comfort and assurance in recalling how God had cared for him in the past. Mm -hmm. Do you realize how much sure. God's done for you already in your past? and what he's still doing for you in the present. First, he realizes that God has upheld him from birth and even taken him out of his mother's womb. Then he acknowledges that God has taught him from his youth. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. Right. And then we've all had some terrible moments of discouragement in life. And here's our question to ponder. How, though, through though, can focusing on the ways that the Lord has been with you in the past help you press on ahead in faith and trust in the moments when he seems far away? Yeah, and that's, and that the end of the lesson kind of brings that out. The depths of the earth was really a deep state of depression. Yeah. You know, and it's like David understood he faced depression. God's people, you know, even we were talking, you know, even John the Baptist, right, when he was going to be beheaded, you know, he's wondering if Jesus, are you really the Messiah, you know, yeah. in that moment? Right. So we all face different struggles and challenges, even, even mentally at different times. But and we all have tough times come. Anybody yeah. here want to say they've never had a tough time? Hit them. If, 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 if you hold up your hand, I'm going to call you out. No, there you I go, know. big head, I'm going to call you out. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I appreciate it. But nonetheless, we all have tough times. But can you see Jesus through the tough time? Is that your focus? And, it, and the resurrection. And the resurrection, no matter the what. The resurrection is I, key. You know, we've all, if those of us who are all adults here, we've all lost someone in our life that we love and that we miss. And, mm -hmm. and as a friend of mine, he lost his mom this last week, and, and he's going through the time we've counseled him. You know, and it's like I agreed with him. There's a chunk of your heart now missing when you lose your mom, and that chunk will never come back because mm -hmm. we love our love family. Which one? You know, we all do. I don't want to lose a loved one, but can you see past that pain and suffering? And that's like he said, my mom's a Christian, so I will see my mom again. Mm -hmm. He had a hope. He had hope, and that's what we're after here. The whole thing is surrounding on this hope. Yeah. The, the one that I, the text that came to my mind when I read this question at the bottom, when, is, and it got me through a tough time that I had, was Romans 8, 28. Mm. All things work for good for those that love the Lord according to his purpose and his plan. Right? Mm -hmm. I, had to, I had to hang on to that. And, of course, the tough thing that happened to me was really bad because it was my brother when he was murdered. Mm -hmm. And then the murderer got off scot-free in the courts of our system because of a technical, technical error by the district attorney. And then I had to grab another text because I wanted to get even. I wanted a pound of flesh. And it took me years to overcome this, and so I share this. 
painful story sometimes to help you see that there is hope beyond. By having faith in the Lord and knowing that God was right, the other text that got me through is, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. I read that text. I read the chapter in front of it. I read the chapter behind it. I tried every way in the world to wiggle myself into God's business. <laughs> and it took me yeah. a long time to get to the point where I can pray for this person that murdered my brother, that this person will have a come-to-Jesus experience and recognize their dependence and need to have a right relationship with the Lord. And I'm praying that the Lord, when we get to heaven, that my guardian angel will take me and introduce me to this person, and I'll hear that story of redemption. Yeah. Well, it's like Paul, because, it's like Paul and Stephen. Right. Paul, you know, the early Christians, there's no way. They were not ready to accept Paul as an apostle. He had killed a lot of Christians. Because he had, he had put a lot of people to death. He'd been part of it. But the people then had to do the same thing I had to do. They had to go through that process and recognize that God was working. And this is why later what's, what's interesting is that it's, it's so right for Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. I hope you don't mind me go reading ahead. that because we just kind of mentioned this. And then it kind of goes to Wednesday where it says, Your dead shall live. And that's, you know, Wednesday's focus. But I, I just want to go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 because this is Paul writing. So what's, what's amazing to me is you think about it just for a second... Where Paul, sorry, I got to get there. That's all right. First Thessalonians chapter four, and it's uh, verse, verse uh, 16, 17, 18. I'll just kind of read those. It says, uh, he says, um, verse 15, it says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So he starts out by saying we don't need to be ignorant and we do not need to sorrow as others that have no hope. But it's interesting to me that it's Paul that's writing these words because Paul was there at the death of Stephen. So Paul's watching Stephen die when Paul is currently in a frame of mind that these Christians need to be killed, right? But in the end, Paul knows, after coming face to face with Jesus on the road to Damascus, that he was resurrected, that he actually lives, okay? He learns and understands later that guess who he's going to see? Now, Stephen doesn't know that Saul, Paul's going to be there. Right. But Paul knows who's going to be there. Stephen's going to be there. Yeah. Right? Because Paul's giving us these words of encouragement saying, listen, I know that those people that gave their life to Christ that I, as a wretched man, right, killed, he says, those people I'm going to see again. Right. Right? I'm going to see them in the kingdom because there's that, that resurrection. That resur and, he, and Paul's learning more about that resurrection anyway isn't that a wonderful thought so isn't that what's that's that's the whole basis of it forgiveness hope resurrection life if you don't get that right relationship with jesus do you have any hope and we have to get this hope by faith we read the bible we read the stories you will experience it as you take actions in your life as you grow and you see how much better you are by having given up your anger, your hatred, your pain, and your suffering. And, and, and going back to that, for, exactly, and going back to that first verse yeah. that we read, that we would be resurrected in our flesh, Paul is going to know Stephen. And Stephen is going to know Paul. They're not just going to be floating elements out there that have no body, no form. They're, they're going to be known as they're known. Um, I know our time's kind of running out, but anyway, it. go ahead, Don. Sorry about that. Here, we'll get into it Wednesday, exactly what you just were talking about. Your dead shall live. I'm going to read this in Isaiah 26, verses 14 and 19. Here, verse 14. They are dead. They will not live. They are deceased. They will not rise. Therefore, you have punished and destroyed them and made all their memories to perish. Talking about the wicked specifically. Right. Talking about the wicked here. Mm -hmm. 
And then dropping down to verse 19, here we go. This is the blessed hope that you and I have. Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body, they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in the dust. Notice what's going to arise. It says the dead body yeah. will arise. Anyway, go ahead. God's in charge. He knows how to put it back together. If he could speak it into existence the first time around, he could do it again. See, and that's the thing, sorry, that's the thing that really is beyond us. There is no way that we could figure out how God actually does that. When you go to Ezekiel chapter 37, we're not going to go there, but you go to Ezekiel chapter 37, Ezekiel comes up to this, like, basically this whole bit of land that's full of a lot of dead bones. And the Lord asks him a question, can these dead bones live? Yeah. You know, and, and, and all Ezekiel says is, well, you know, Lord. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't tell you that, but, but you know. You know, and you know how. Exa and, and, and through the word of God again, these bones start to move, and flesh starts to come to them, and all of a sudden they're, they rise up. And anyway, anyway, that's beyond us. It's beyond our comprehension, but we trust and, and right. have faith. For your dew is like the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. But we are told that there's something else going to happen. It's in Malachi. Yeah. Those that are not righteous, what's going to finally happen to them, Marshall? They Malachi will they'll neither be root nor branch. They will, be, they will be consumed. They will be burned up. They will be burned up. They will be like consumed. a wheat stubble field. Have you ever seen a wheat stubble field burn? Mm -hmm. It's a flash fire. <laughs> and it is gone. You know what's interesting about this casting out? Um, and we're coming to a close. This casting out, which is interesting. Remember Jonah? Right? Jesus said he was, in the, he was in the grave, right? Three nights, three days, like Jonah was in the belly of the whale. And, and the whale, what did the whale do when Jonah eventually had to like, right? The whale what? Spit him out, right? Yeah. Like just threw him to the land. It's interesting that here in this verse, it's like the grave is going to what? Cast you out. It's going to cast you Put out. You out. It's, it's interesting. It's like that whale taking Jonah and throwing him to shore. It's like the grave's literally going to open up and people are just going to fly out of the grave. Um, at, at the last trump. But final thought, Daniel 12, verse 2, those who sleep in the dust shall awake. It's either to everlasting life or everlasting contempt. That's the real choice that any of us have. And our life that we live sets us up for which way it is. Amen. Are you going to have everlasting life or everlasting contempt? And we're out of time, Pastor. If you'd tell about yeah, our thing just really and then, quick, and then our... close with prayer. Okay. Just really quick, our free offer is The Mystery of Death. It's a small little booklet. Go to our website, whitehousesda.com. Go to our library and just click, find this book, The Mystery of Death. Click on the word free, fill out the little form, and we'll send this book to you. want to encourage you to go and tell your friends about it. Get it. It's a great little book. And let's have a word of prayer as we close. And uh, stay with us, those of you online. We will shortly begin our service. Loving Father, again, we thank you for your presence here with us. We thank you for our Bible. We thank you for the hope that we have by having trust and faith in you. Be with us now as we separate and bring us back together shortly for our worship service. So be thy will. Amen.